you are probably familiar with the story of Mawson, but I'll just give you a, a potted version of the whole story because what I want to do is just go through and show you a whole lot of images. Many of them were taken by Frank Hurley and other members of the 1911-1914 expedition just to highlight a little bit about the people, the stories and what happened during those times. The other thing that I want to do as well is to um, emphasise a little bit of the work and, and the people associated with the other parties that weren't with Douglas Mawson at Cape Denison. Um, a bloke called uh, Harrison had his diaries published uh, just late last year and it was, in, it was actually entitled The Forgotten Men, the Western Party, and they're often overlooked, so I want to go through that. But in a nutshell, Mawson first went to the Antarctic in 1909 with Shackleton and so he got a bit of a taste for it and they often say when you go down there you get ice in your veins. And I think Mawson did, was, he was afflicted by that. So he then set about his, uh, setting up his own major expedition. Shackleton was going to be the leader and Mawson was going to be the leader of science. But he didn't want it just to be one of these mere ge geographical exercises. He wanted to do some serious science. And that was what he set about doing. Now to do that, he wanted to set up four st um, stations. Um, he was also an innovator. One of those stations was going to be at Macquarie Island as a radio relay station so that he could have the first radio wireless contact with the Antarctic continent. But the wireless signal wasn't strong enough to go the whole distance. Have a relay at Macquarie, which is about halfway, that's one station. Three continental stations at which they'd be doing um, geographical work, magnetic work, geological, biological, meteorological, um, doing some work with... Uh, astronomical observations as well, huge programs. In the end, he only settled on two bases because they couldn't find suitable sites for the teams to land. Um, the, well, the first site that they came to was Cape Denison, and that was where Mawson and his team ended up. Um, originally, uh, this building here was going to be the living quarters for the second Antarctic party. They just combined the two and had 18 people staying at Cape Denison. They then set along, went looking for a place, dropped off another eight men about 2,000 kilometres west of Cape Denison, and then they were staying for a year. Um, tragedy struck Mawson's party when he was on the Far Eastern sledging, part, sledging journey. Two men died on that journey, and unfortunately, that tragedy often tends to overshadow the scientific work that they did during the, the expedition. Um, they were still publishing the results from this time in 1947. And there were something like 22 volumes of scientific works produced. It was quite extraordinary um, the amount of work that was done. And I think it was also one of the reasons why um, the people survived and managed to get on fairly well with each other. It was because they had such um, a lot of work to do and they also had Mawson pushing them and driving them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Um, Okay, so just to set the scene, um, selected the men, headed off from Hobart down to Macquarie Island. The ship was at overloaded with um, goods and materials. You know, you're going to build three huts. You've got supplies for a year for 30 people. Um, but they needed another ship to carry it all down. When they got to Macquarie Island, they then set about putting the, setting up the radio trans, transmitter there. It was then straight down to the continent. It took a long time before they found a reasonable area to land at Cape Denison. And at Cape Denison they found a nice rock, rocky outcrop, decided here's one camp. Um, once they were established, Davis, uh, Captain Davis, who was in charge of the Aurora, then set off trying to find somewhere else to land, the other, west, the other western party. They ended up settling here, where they put the western base. It's not even on the continent. It's on a floating ice shelf called the Shackleton Ice Shelf and left them there. Um, Macquarie, fantastic place. If you get the opportunity to go there, go. It is just the most amazing um, place as far as wildlife goes. Something like three and a half million birds there, 850,000 penguins, albatross, elephant seals, fur, fur seals, you name it. It's a stunning place. It had been known since the early 1800s. And the reason it was known was just for what you could kill there and uh, exploit economically. Um, initially, they tackled the fur seals, and so they took all of the fur from them, wiped them out in about five years, completely wiped out the whole population. They then turned their attention from that to the elephant seals, 
It took them 17 years to obliterate those. And mainly they were just getting all the blubber from them, boiling it down and getting the, the oil and the fats from them. So here you can see some of this, this trade. You can also see it was, wasn't a particularly friendly place for ships, so there's a shipwreck there. These are all just penguins on the beach. Anyway, when Morse and his team went down there, um, they had to set up the radio. The radio masts were monstrous um, Oregon timbers. You get some idea of the scale when you see the men here. This, there we go. And it was a difficult job just getting them up, especially in the windy conditions. Two huts up on the top of Wireless Hill. Um, one was the engine room to drive the generators and the other was the transmitter hut. I wanted to separate them because they're, they're using Morse code and so they needed to have a bit of quiet because otherwise you don't, just don't pick up the signals. The living quarters, um, the chap standing at the front there was Ainsworth, the leader. A relatively small building and I've got a plan of that. This was down the bottom of the hill. As it turned out, um, Ainsworth ended up pretty much living down the bottom here by himself. He didn't get on well with uh, the rest of the team. It can be a fairly isolating experience when you end up becoming a team of one. The two radio people spent most of their time up on top of the hill. Now, they needed to be up there anyway because they sent their signals at about between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning. But it was easier just to stay and sleep up there. The other two blokes just decided it's better for us if we just disappear off and do our work. So they'd disappear for months at a time, take food, and then they'd go around the island doing their mapping, geological work and biological work. So Ainsworth, who was doing all of the meteorological work, spent a lot of time by himself. The hut is typical of uh, what we'd call a heroic era um, expedition hut. The leader had a room to himself, so a little cubicle to himself, and the rest then slept in bunks. So two bunks here, one up, one down. Blake... Um, and there's another bunk there as well um, for Hamilton. But a relatively small building, if you look at the scale up there in terms of feet, so you're looking at just over four metres square for the building itself. The individuals, um, Ainsworth, the leader, did the meteorological work. Hamilton was a biologist. Hamilton and Blake were the two that just disappeared off and spent most of their time uh, away from the main station. They did an incredible amount of work. Um, and then we had the, the two radio operators, mechanic and, and operator. Um, Ainsworth, I think, set the tone for the expedition when he was first put ashore. And he was there with his bags, waiting for someone to carry his bags ashore for him. <laughs> it doesn't really sort of set it well for uh, the rest of your team when you have that sort of attitude. Mawson, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. He not only... Uh, he was a very driven, very, very hard-working person and he would do, expect no one to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. When they were taking materials ashore at Cape Denison, a box fell overboard and Mawson just peeled his gear off and dived into the water to, tr to retrieve it. Um, the water's minus two and a half degrees Celsius, so it's pretty cool. You've only got two or three minutes in there before you freeze. Um, the, the sad thing about this was Blake did a lot of fantastic work. Um, when they were relieved um, after two years, um, he went off, was in the war. About six weeks before the end of the war, he was in the artillery. His horse got hit by a shell and killed. He had his leg blown off and he died the next day. So it was a sad end um, for Blake, unfortunately. The other thing that I didn't mention when I, when I spoke about the potted version earlier, with Mawson and his, his expedition team, when he had the tragedy on the sledging journey where Mertz and Ninnis died, he got back to the base too late to be relieved by Davis, who had already left. So they had to spend another year down there. Now, it had extra repercussions because if they're going to spend another year down there, they also needed the radio team to spend another year down there. And that was a fairly big ask. Ainsworth did ask the others, um, are you happy to stay for a year? They chose to stay, um, which I think was a credit to them, considering that there was a fair amount of disharmony amongst the people. OK, the main base... Um, just to give you an idea of the scale, you're looking at around 2,670 kilometres um, down to the edge of the pack ice. Some of Hurley's shots. That's the Aurora, the ship that uh, they travelled down. Remember, this is a wooden ship, strengthened hull. Um, it was an old Dundee whaler, a very, very robust ship. Now, once they landed, when they first got there, it was a fantastic day. 
It was just beautiful. It was calm, sunny skies. And I thought, what a ripper. We've got this great place, rock. There's a natural little um, spot where we can build the hut. And so away they went. But little did they know that they'd chosen to have their base at the windiest place on earth at sea level. While they were there, they recorded wind gusts of over 300 kilometres an hour. And the average daily wind speed is 77 kilometres an hour. Now, just think, that's the average. Um, and you have calm days. So it, it really means that it really blows and blows when it's going. But they, they worked like Trojans to unload all of the building materials and then away they went to uh, erect the hut. Oh, the buildings themselves. None of them were builders. None of them were carpenters. They were all scientists. They were all young. Average age of about 26. Um, there were a couple in their 40s. Um, but what they'd done is they'd prefabricated them beforehand, colour-coded the timbers. It's a bit like, I guess, Ikea without the, uh, you know, the little yeah, um, device to put all the timbers together. So that helped to get them up very quickly. It took a couple of weeks. And you can see them just working away on this thing here. A critical part of the whole thing is this stove, which ran 24 hours a day. So the building itself, because they decided they'd used up so much time, so much coal, just travelling around, they knew they couldn't set up a third um, station on the continent, so they just added the other building onto the end of this one here, put a door through. This became the workshop. This was the living quarters. The design Mawson had learnt from his time with Shackleton that you want a strong building. So built on a pyramid shape, just a square, verandas on three sides, sloping down to only five foot in the old language, which meant that you got the winds deflected up and over. On the southern windward side, they put all of their boxes of supplies, which helped to trap the snow, and then the wind would come over the top of the building, which again made the building a lot more stable. Living in tents until the whole thing was put up. Now, you won't be able to read any of this, but, but basically, that's the living quarters there. As with the other one, Mawson had his own little cubicle with a bunk in it. All of the rest of them around here were double bunks around the side. Now, 18 men living in an area that was 7.3 metres by 7.3 metres. So, in the old parlance, 24 feet. Um, all double bunks, except for Murphy, who Murphy was going to be the field leader for the third Thing. So he was lucky enough, he got a bunk without someone laying on top of him and snoring and doing the rest of it. The one thing I think you probably could um, work out is how much it would smell in that, in that hut. 18 blokes, um, they would get to have a, a bath once or a wash once every 18 days. Because the night watchman, and they'd have to have a night watchman to keep the fire going, keep the stove going, make sure the hut didn't catch fire. While everyone else is sleeping, he'd boil a bit of water and have a wash. Um, and most of them smoked. That's the other thing too. So uh, it's really going to be reasonably unpleasant in there. But stove here, kitchen. This was the dark room that Hurley used. A big dining table so they could all sit around. Over in this corner here was what they called Hyde Park Corner. And I'll show you some images of that. And then the workshop with the wireless here, lathes, stoves and so on. The dogs were housed off to the, uh, the side here. In the second year, they moved the wireless from there into the main hut, and it worked in the second year. It didn't work very well in the first year. In addition to where they lived and um, worked in the main building, they also put up an astronomical obs observatory. So this building here, it had a slot in the roof for taking star sightings. Put up the radio masts, they'd put them up, they'd get blown down, they'd snap off, they'd put them up again. Um, I mentioned previously that Mawson was an innovator. Um, he took down this plane here. It was, it was Vickers number two, um, but they called it Vickers number one. Um, the reason being that Vickers number one crashed and was trashed beyond uh, salvation. So they called this Vickers number one. Before Mawson took it down to the Antarctic, it also crashed. It crashed when they were taking test flights, damaged the wings irreparably, and as a result of that, um, they couldn't take it down to fly. Probably a good thing because I think people would have died if they'd tried to fly it in the Antarctic. But he took the wings off it and thought, we'll just use this to tow sledges around the place. And so that was the idea. Use it as a mechanised thing. It's an interesting uh, um, device 
This, by the way, is uh, Dice Murphy. I'll talk a little bit more about him later. He was one of these blokes I think you've got to have on an expedition because you need people that are going to break up a bit of the seriousness, be a little bit of a fool, have a bit of fun. But uh, the interesting thing was how you turn this device. You had to use the um, air tractor with three men. One in the, in the driver's seat and two people standing down here on the sleds, on these skids. Because these things are screws. If you want to turn to the left, the bloke on this side here would turn the screw so it digs into the ice and then the, the tractor would swing that way. So they had no way of turning it otherwise. As it turned out, it went for about 12 kilometres and then the motor seized, blew up, snapped the propeller and so that was the end of it. So it was a nice thought, but it just didn't work unfortunately. The good thing was that the dogs, the sledges, they all worked well. Inside the hut, just to give you a bit of an idea of what it was like, um, beige and a couple of others just working. In through this door here was the workshop, um, kitchen bench, off here was the stove that went 24 hours a day. They burnt um, coal and they also burnt, burnt seal blubber. Um, to the left of that was Hurley's dark room. And this is Hyde Park Corner. Um, fantastic, you can just sort of see the blokes. They've just had their evening meal and afterwards, what do you do? You're all going to get together and you're going to get, sit around there and chuff on your pipes. All of them just sitting around smoking and chatting. Um, later in one of the shot slides that I'll show you, up on the top here is actually painted in black paint, Hyde Park Corner. All of the people painted their initials and the year on the bunk that they slept in. And so you see where they were for that first year. In the second year, you see where they moved to. And all the people that were on the southern end of the building that got the wind and the drift snow coming through moved towards the northern end closer to the fire. But it's nice because you've got this memory of where they were. The sad thing is Hyde Park Corner because it was in this corner here that Francis Bickerton, Cecil Madigan, Xavier Mertz and Belgrave Ninnis, that was where their bunks were. Ninnis and Mertz died and it became, became, or went, I should say, from a corner that was a social hub basically, of this little hut to a place of desolation. Now, the other one is this one. This is Dice Murphy. Um, that's him there in Hyde Park Corner. This is also Dice Murphy um, earlier in the 1900s. Um, he went to Oxford, and while he was at Oxford, he was in a few pantomimes, played the role of a woman, and he was recruited to travel around Europe dressed up as a woman, as Edith Dice Murphy, in the early 1900s, spying on the French and Belgian train systems so that they could work out, uh, you know, how big the stations were, how they, how, what sort of troop movements could be accommodated in these different stations. Um, so he actually makes a damn good looking woman, I reckon. <laughs> um, the other thing was, interestingly, he applied um, for a spot on one of Sh on Shackleton's earlier expedition and he was rejected on the grounds of being too effeminate. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite interesting because I don't really know what Mawson would have made of someone like Dice Murphy. Give you a bit of an idea of what the chaos would have been like in the building as well. Um, you go outside, you work, you can still build up a hell of a sweat if you're working hard. You bring your clothes in, you've got to put them somewhere to dry. And so every available bit of space up in, the, in the, re the higher parts of the building that would have been up there so they can dry. This is beige, just uh, working on with a sewing machine trying to fix the sleeping bag. Inside the workshop, again, it's got a bit of a smoky haze to it. Um, the generator here, a lathe and so on. What's left in Mawson's huts now is not very much. There's not a lot of equipment, there's not much there at all because, because uh, Mawson and his team had to spend, well, six people plus Mawson spent an extra year there, there was another year of expedition costs. And so Mawson took everything that he thought he could sell, took it back with him so that he could sell it off. Um, he, was, he was sort of interesting. He went back, when he went back in 1929, 30 and 30, 31 as part of the Banzari expedition, he realised he'd left the sewing machine behind. So he grabbed that then as well and took it back. So there's, there are certainly reminders of the people, but a lot of it's the smaller personal objects that didn't have any commercial value. The magnetograph house, um, this one they built twice. Um, the second time they built it, it wasn't going to fall down. Um, the first time it got blown away. And so the second time they just collected rocks from everywhere and put it around it, especially on the southern side, which is down there. You'll see the roof slopes up this way as well, so the wind would be deflected up and over. 
covered it with hessian, sheep skins, everything to keep it snow free. That building is still snow free. It's interesting though, we, we put data loggers and things in there to monitor the environment and measure corrosion and so on. I went there in 2006 and we, could, we didn't even know where the building was. It was completely buried under a couple of metres of snow. It's, uh, it can be preserved by the elements just in that way. One of Hurley's classic photos. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's wetter and close outside, just collecting ice. It's interesting, there's the most fresh water on, in the entire world is in the Antarctic, but the problem you have is getting water because it's all, fr it's all solid and you've got to melt it. So it's, it's quite energy expensive. But they did have tremendous hassles just trying to stand upright in there, in the wind. And Mawson insisted they work. Didn't matter what the conditions were, if you're taking the magnetic readings, you've got to go 300 metres um, to the magnetograph house and to the absolute magnetic hut and do your work. If you're taking the Met observations, you get out there and you do it. And you can see here, you get some indication of what the wind's like. Uh, Madigan is just trying to hang on to this thing, which is on the top of a hill. The wind's got inside his clothes and is billowing out as well. But I think it's part of the reason why they, they were actually able to live and survive so well in that first year. With ha by having a strong focus on work, and Mawson insisted that they work hard, I think that gave them that, that drive, and it would sort of cut down a lot of the potential um, problems that can arise when you have people living in such close quarters. Beige at the Astronomical ob uh, Observatory, and I've got some photos of that later, you'll see it's more a ruin now. Okay, the sledging journeys. They covered a tremendous amount of distance. The southern party here, um, that was with Hurley, Beige and Webb, they were trying to get to the South Magnetic Pole. They got fairly close to it, but they didn't quite make it. But they were covered a distance of around, just below 600 uh, kilometres um, out. Others went in different uh, directions. Whoops. Um, to the west, over the sea ice, around the place. This was Mawson's journey, the Far East staging journey. And it was at this point here where Ninnis went down a crevasse. Absolutely tragic. Mawson had already... Uh, Mertz was skiing ahead. And it, it's an interesting thing. The dogs will pull sleds and they'll run if they've got a target. Because if, when you're on a featureless plane, there's nothing for them to run towards. And so Mertz, who was the, the Swiss cross-country skiing champion, he'd be skiing ahead. And then um, he pointed out crevasse here, crossed it. Mawson went across it with his dog sled as well and his dog team. Ninnis was the third in line. He went down the crevasse. Um, the thought is that he wasn't on the sled. He was running next to the sled. And you run, you have a point pressure through your feet so you, have a, you don't spread the weight over a big surface area. Created enough pre downward pressure to break the bridge of the crevasse. Down he went. No trace of him. Um, the, it would have been horrific um, if it had been observed. On the side of the crevasse, they're all dog paw marks. So what had happened, Ninnis had gone down, the sled had gone down and pulled the dogs backwards um, down into the crevasse as well. One dog survived for a short amount of time, about 50 metres down, just whining on a cliff on, on this ledge where it landed. They couldn't do anything. 90% of their food gone, their tent gone. Um, so Mertz and Mawson had a tent cover, a pole that they could use, 10% of their food, um, to cover a distance of 500 kilometres to get back. Um, it's almost a mission impossible. So they, they decided, they took a gamble. They said, we'll take the shorter um, inland route rather than going down to the sea and hoping they might be able to kill some seals or penguins um, because they didn't know what the sea ice would be like. Um, they progressively killed and ate the older dogs, or the dogs as they weakened and died of starvation. They were even doing things like boiling up the dogs' paws. Um, it, it would have been horrific, especially for Mertz, who was a vegetarian. You can imagine you've got to eat all this stuff, and meat would turn your stomach anyway. Um, he eventually died um, after being in a fever for a couple of days. Um, terrible, a terrible death. Initially, it was thought that it was probably due to vitamin A poisoning. Um, the more recent thought is that he died from a combination of starvation, exertion and depression. Because Mertz and Ninnis were almost inseparable on the expedition. No one spoke about, um, they wouldn't speak about Mertz without it being Mertz and Ninnis, or Ninnis and Mertz. Because they looked after the dogs, they worked together. 
And so I could understand, and I, th I think I lean more towards that last um, version as well. The interesting thing is, um, there is a, a very strong possibility that his body could be found there still. According to the location where, uh, that Mawson gave for um, leaving Mertz, um, I've had some discussions with a chap called Benoit Legressi, who's a, a French glaciologist, and he said that in this area here, the ice is not moving, so it's not going out to sea. Um, it's also not an area of accumulation, and so the chances are the body would still be there. Ninus, on the other hand, um, would be long gone out to sea. Okay, so died there. Mawson had a, a horrific trip back, fell down crevasses, managed to pull himself out. Um, he got to a point where the others who'd gone out looking for him had left a supply of fresh food. And so he got some fresh food. He then made it to an area called Aladdin's Cave, which is about only a matter of about seven or eight kilometres from the camp. And there was also fresh fruit there, so he knew the ship was in. But then he got caught in a blizzard for a week. Couldn't get down there, arrived hours after the ship had gone. They radioed the ship and said, come back. They couldn't come back because the winds were too strong. Davis then made the decision, we can't stay. If we stay here and try to get back, the blizzard might hang around for a week. We'll be too late to rescue the Western Party. And he felt these people are at least safe. They left a, a party back at the hut of six people to look after any survivors that came back. We've got to go and rescue the others who were living on an ice cliff. And so they left them there for another year. A hard decision, but I think the right decision. So just a few shots. Um, this is what they do, by the way. When they're heading out on uh, these sledging journeys, they cache food. Initially, you go out and you cache some food here. You go a bit further, you cache some more food. The reason being so that when you are doing your normal sledging journey, you don't have to carry so much. You can go out, you continue on your merry way. On your way back, you've got food supplies. Um, and so they're, they're obviously well marked so that uh, you can find them. The other nice thing, um, for the southern part at least, is the wind always blows from the south. So when they're on their way back, um, just rig up a sail. And it's going to make it a hell of a lot easier for you to, uh, to make that journey. And this was critical because they ran out of food. They also got caught in a, in a blizzard and they thought, what do we do? Do we just stay in our tent and die of starvation or do we make a, make a run for it? And Hurley convinced the others to go for it. And they did. They weren't even sure what the right direction that they were going. But they managed to make it back to the hut. There are, all, there are so many amazing stories associated with all of this. This was Mertz, Ninnis and Murphy and the dogs at Aladdin's Cave. Aladdin's Cave was just a snow cave, or an ice cave. They just dug it into the ground. So a refuge where if the wind's blowing too strongly, you can get down there. And just you're out of the wind, you're safe, it's warm. Um, this is the memorial plaque. Um, in the second year, um, Bickett, sorry, Hodgman carved this and put it um, so with, a, with a huge cross um, that was made out of radio masts on Azimuth Hill as a memorial to Belgrave and Innocent Xavier Mertz. Now, the original is in Hobart at the Antarctic Division, but there's a replica plaque there. And this one is, um, I re think, really quite poignant. I, can you read that up the back, by the way? Okay, because just the sadness of the people that were left behind because um, Bickerton uh, and Madigan were in the, in the six that stayed behind. So they were there in a hut that the previous year had 18 people in. There's now seven of them, including a very sick Mawson, and they've got Hyde Park Corner. Um, that's Hyde Park Corner now. Um, you can see just written up the top here, Hyde Park Corner painted on the top. It does look bare, barren, and I think it brings home you know, the desolation. And for me, anyway, it's a really powerful feeling of just what it would have been like for them um, to come back there and uh, Ninnis and Mertz were no longer around. OK, I'll move on to the Western Party. I don't expect you to read that. But uh, basically, they went looking for a place to land. They couldn't find anything. Um, eventually, they got to a point where they were, they were just run. The Aurora was running out of fuel. They needed somewhere. And they came to the Shackleton Ice Shelf. And Wild said, you can, put, you can leave us here. It'll be OK. Um, they, they had to go up about 30 metres, I guess, um, up onto this, this ice cliff, move all of their materials a long way back and build their hut. Davis wasn't all that happy about doing it. And he said to Frank Wild, he said, I just want you to write me a note just saying, you know, dear Captain Davis, I'm really happy that you're going to leave us here. 
and I'm glad to spend the next 12 months on this ice shelf with my men. Because Davis didn't want to leave them there. The ice shelf break off, float out to sea, and they all die. So he said, write something just so that my rear end is covered. And so Wilde did that. The good thing is this was Wilde's third Antarctic trip. He was a veteran um, of Scott and Shackle earlier Scott, Scott and Shackleton's expeditions, so he was a very, very good leader and a good person to have at that party. Um, this was Frank Wilde here. Harrison uh, was a biologist and then the other men in the party. Interestingly, um, where is he? Dover's down the bottom here. His son um, became the first <coughs> field leader at Mawson Station when Mawson Station was first established in 1954. But they had a fantastic year. Um, Wilde was a different sort of a leader to um, Mawson. He expected them to do all of their work, but he also let them play. So they'd do their work in the morning into the early afternoon, and then he said, do whatever you like after that. And so they'd go outside, and I read Harrison's diaries last year, and they'd go outside and they'd play football on the ice. Uh, or they'd go sliding down the ice slopes. Or they'd just go out and take some photographs of penguins. So they had sort of a, what I considered to be a fantastic year. They did their work, but they had a bit of fun. And they all got on well. The, the only unfortunate thing, I guess, was for Harrison. He was the oldest one of the party. He was the only non-smoker. And when I read his diaries, he said there were times when he had to run outside and throw up because he was just choking on the smoke inside the hut. So this is the aurora on the ice edge. It just parked up against the fast ice. Then they had to set up a flying fox, drag everything up the top. Dogs, um, building materials, away they went. And then they built the hut. It's exactly the same dimensions as the other one. The good thing about this hut was it had felt over the entire surface. And so that kept it snow free. So it was a very cosy environment. That's the hut a couple of months after it was put up. Completely covered in snow and ice. Um, but this is where Wilde's experience showed as well. Because what he did was he just said, oh well, let's just build a whole lot of tunnels around here. He stored all of the food, all of the boxes, everything inside the tunnels so they didn't have to go outside to um, get their food. They'd just open the door, go into the tunnel, grab a box, bring it, bring it in. Actually, that reminds me of one story I probably should have told you about the other hut. The other hut had a cellar under the, under the building. Murphy was in charge of the stores and what he'd do if he wanted a leg of lamb or some meat, he'd just throw a husky in there. And the husky would go in there, grab a chunk of meat, come out, Murphy would grab the dog and then get the meat. And uh, you read in the diaries and it said, sometimes the dog won. So it got, par got past Murphy and that was the end of their meat. They then have to send another dog in to get some more meat. Because it was only a small hole and grovelling around down there wouldn't have been that much fun. But there's just showing a ladder, you know, just to get out to the, to the building, out from the uh, veranda and so on, the tunnels. They also did a lot of um, exploration. It was very difficult terrain though. You're on, a, on an ice shelf, very heavily crevassed. It wasn't um, nice territory to be moving around in, but they still covered a heck of a lot of ground, a lot of cartography. They did the same sort of biological work. Not a lot of, not a lot of opportunity for geological work, but where there were exposed islands and so on, they could do that. But I think this is where probably a little bit of experience, but also it might have been because the conditions were so bad, they had to be more cautious than the other party. But you can see here, they're just crossing a heavily crevassed area where there's a lot of really broken snow. But there's one bloke here. He's broke. He's roped to this chap. He's roped to the sled. He's roped over to this chap. They all have harnesses. And there are numerous times, the number of times they fell down crevasses, they lost count of it. So they'd just be falling down. And they become almost quite nonchalant about it. They're just describing the beautiful blues and greens of the ice while they're hanging there, you know, five metres down, just waiting to be pulled out but you've got to have a lot of faith in your harnesses. Um, they, they did have, their, have a little bit of a drama there as well um, with, uh, with their time there because on one of the last sledging journeys um, that Wilde left, Harrison wanted to come along with him just so he could have a look at some uh, snow petrol colonies. And uh, Wilde wasn't keen for him to come, but he said, OK, look, you can come along and then head back. He was going to be away two weeks. Unfortunately, when they got to this area where the snow petrels were, and there had been a food cache and a sled there, it had all been dispersed by the wind. And so they needed Harrison's sled and his food to continue on. And so Harrison went with them. Now Moyes, who was left back at the camp, was expecting Harrison after two weeks, and he never turned up. 
So he then was he was he spent nine weeks altogether just thinking that Harrison was dead. Um, he got his own sledge organised and went out looking for him. Couldn't find him. Came back, and so psychologically there would have been a huge pressure on him. And this is just waiting for the aurora. Oh, just one more story too, just about being left there while I remember it. Um, the other thing with, with Wilde and Davis, just before Davis left them on this snow cliff, um, Wilde just sort of yelled out to Davis. He said, look, I uh, hope you have a safe journey back to Hobart. And Davis, whose nickname was Gloomy, just said, you better hope we do because he said, no one else knows where you are. So they would have, they would have been absolutely had it because um, they did have a radio, but it couldn't transmit any distance. The other thing was when they unpacked all, all of the radio, there weren't enough parts there to make the radio operational. So that didn't help. They also dipped out because the sewing machine they were meant to have didn't, wasn't there either in their supplies, and so they had to do all of their sewing by hand. This is just waiting for the uh, aurora to come while just relaxing on the top. This is also nice when you read it in the journals, and uh, you see Davis sort of saying, I was, I was starting to wonder what had happened at the, with the Western Party. I left eight people there. When he came back, he could see 12 people in the, or 12 figures on the shore. And there were sort of the, the eight blokes and four emperor penguins just sort of out, out waiting. I've included this, this cartoon as well because Mawson, I think, must have been a fairly polarising individual. This is a contemporary cartoon of the time. Um, so Douglas Mawson listening to nice things about himself. So there's, there's sort of probably a couple of different views uh, about Mawson, um, including views about whether or not he ate any of Mertz to, to survive on that trip. Personally, I don't think he did. I think that Mawson was too straight and too, I think, fixed in his beliefs to even contemplate doing anything like that. Okay, very quickly, um, this is an interesting one because you might get an idea when you think um, Wilde and his team were on an ice shelf. Um, when we went there in January this year, um, we couldn't get in to Commonwealth Bay and, or to Cape Denison on a boat because there were 20 kilometres here of solid fast ice and that came about because this thing here which originally was one iceberg parked itself there, trapped the pack ice, it froze solid and then um, you couldn't get the ships in. This iceberg by the way is about two and a half thousand square kilometres. So it's, I wanted to include this just to give a bit of an idea of the scale of operations or scale of things down there and how it came about. This is the Mertz Glacier Tongue sticking out into the, uh, into the Antarctic Ocean. This is the land here. Cape Denison is down there. The French station at De Monteville is here. This thing is the big iceberg B9B, which had broken off from the Ross Sea. It's, and they, uh, the drift is from east to west. So it came along. It just gave the Mertz Glacier tongue a bit of a nudge, cracked it. A few days later, bigger crack, a bit more, and off she goes. Now... The Mertz, this part of the Mertz Glacier Tongue, which is also a couple of thousand square kilometres, is now about 5,000 kilometres to the west. So it just drifted away. Unfortunately, B9B just moved along here. When the water got shallower, it hit the ground, beached itself, and then trapped all the pack ice. And that's made life really quite difficult because ordinarily it's a completely ice-free area at Cape Denison. Tourist ships can get in, we can get in, the reason that we could get in was because the Mertz Glacier would block the pack ice that's moving from east to west. Any that did get around there would get blown out to sea by those howling winds. It also made life very difficult for the penguins. So all of this is normally ocean. Out here, these are just the McCaller Islets. So Cape Denison, Mawson's Huts, that's the transit hut, the astronomical thing. This is normally all water. But what it meant was penguins had 20 kilometres extra to go to get their food. As a result of that, they bred at the rate of about a quarter of their normal breeding this year. So very, very low breeding because they, they're, not, they're only little fellas and to do 20 kilometres, it's a, they use up a lot of energy to do it. This is Mawson's Huts as it was earlier this year. Um, we just had to dig out the door so you could get inside to uh, do a bit of work. This is what it was like before any conservation work was undertaken. Um, 90 odd years of uh, just being ice blasted. Softwood timbers, the wind picks up snow and ice particles and smashes it into the wood um, and it abrades the timbers away. You can see the, the roof on the workshop, some of the timbers are gone completely and it's just tongue and groove timber by the way 
And uh, so you think you only have to get through half the thickness of the timber, the groove and tongue join is going to be exposed and powder snow will get in there anywhere. Just to show you what it's, what it's actually like to get a bit more of a global setting, this is the bit that's all frozen now, all frozen solid. This was Boat Harbour where Mawson came in, parked the little boats there, built the hut there, astronomical observatory there, Mag Ab magnetograph house is here, and the absolute magnetic hut is just in there. So they had four buildings. So you can imagine trying to go from here to there. It's a distance of about 300 metres in a blizzard. In a blizzard you can see maybe a metre, maybe two metres. Close got lost when he went outside to get snow and they found him within 10 metres of the hut, but he couldn't find the hut. So it gives you some idea of what it's like and in, on occasions they had to crawl over there to do their work. The transit hut as it is now, or no, that's actually in a better state than it is now, and the magnetograph house, more, the main living quarters is just off here a little bit. These are the things that bring the hut to life for me, by the way. Um, on the door inside the magnetograph house, and you go through three doors to get inside there, um, you can't read all of that, but basically Beige, who did the magnetic work in the second year, just painted instructions on the door as to what you should do if you want to repeat these magnetic readings. So you can then compare what's going on with the Earth's magnetic field now compared to the early 1900s. The, the sad thing is down the bottom, good luck and a speedy release. RB, Robert Beige, 18th of December 1913. When he came back, and he came back at the end of the first year, went to Gallipoli and was killed in machine gun fire when he was marking out trenches there. So another sad end, unfortunately. Um, You've got to, I've, I'm actually a bit of a softie for a little bit of graffiti and tagging places when you see things like this. When we took a skylight off to repair um, the skylight, we found this, BES Ninnis, January 24, 1912. So he'd got up there with a hammer and nails and just put his tag on the building. And, you know, it's, it's nice to have some sort of tangible reminder. Inside the dark room, if you just sort of peer around the corner of the dark room, and this is on a, um, just on... This is the wall of the building. There are still things like these dry plates there. Hurley's just written, near enough is not good enough, in pencil on there. And it pretty much summarises his attitude towards photography and so on. All right, I'll just start racing through now. Um, so a little bit of speed talking. Um, with conservation issues, this is what the building was like inside the main hut, the main living quarters, in 1984-85. And you get some sort of an idea of what the damage, the damage that of snow ingress had done to the building. Shattered timbers, broken collar ties, smash shelving. Um, it was a real problem. Just to show you what uh, you know, the abrasion can be like, in the second year, Morse and his team put hessian, sheepskins, sailcloth, everything over the outside to try and keep the snow out. And they attached it with battens. You can see where battens have been. And they've protected the wood from the blasting. Timber like that, it's gone from 25 millimetres thick down to one millimetre in parts. The abrasion's quite extraordinary um, on the timbers. So the Mawson's Huts Foundation, um, a private foundation, has sort of been responsible for doing most of the work since about 1996. And initially they sent down um, two conservation architects to inspect the building and work out what to do, what work needed to be done. Got a conservation plan came back and then said, OK, let's do it. So re-adhered timbers to this, put a new roof on the workshop, stabilised the absolute magnetic hut. There wasn't much left of it, but just screwed timbers together. Reattached the cross arm of the memorial cross, put a new roof on the magnetograph house. But there was a very, a very um, what would you call it, robust debate about whether or not you remove snow and ice from the inside of the building. And there was one part of the conservation community that said, you don't remove it. You don't remove it because it stabilises the environment inside. It anchors the building to the bedrock so it won't be blown into, the, uh, into Commonwealth Bay. And also it stops people from pinching stuff. Because, you know, if it's all covered in snow and ice, you're not going to be able to um, grab souvenirs. So there was a fairly long period of monitoring. And we monitor with temperature relative humidity sensors to keep tabs on the environment. We also have vibration data loggers inside the building to measure how much the building moves. We eventually won the argument that you, can't, you, you should remove the snow and ice to stabilise the interior, to expose the spaces. And by monitoring env the, in the environment, we've shown the environment hasn't changed significantly. Um, 
we also have shown that by removing snow and ice, it hasn't led to the building moving more. It doesn't vibrate anymore, um, or more or less, with that snow and ice removed. We've also put corrosion monitors in there so that we can see by removing the snow and ice, has it changed the environment so that, so that you get more corrosion? If it did, we'd have to reconsider because we don't want the, the bolts and nuts and nails that are holding the building together to corrode at an accelerated rate and possibly lead to structural failure. But just some of the uh, problems. Repair work, we always use original um, timbers if we can. Um, glue them, screw them. But if we can't, we have to use a replacement timber. They're always stamped and dated so that uh, you'll know, anyone will know in the future that this wasn't an original part of the building. So there's been quite a lot of work done to, to fix the ceilings and collar ties and so on. But we will use any original materials we can, such as these uh, metal straps, U-bolts, spacer blocks, etc. A bit of ice removal. This was Mawson's cubicle, by the way. Um, he had a little picture gallery along there, so we just removed the snow and ice from that. That was where it was. So we had a couple of big biscuit barrels in there too, a few other bits and pieces. That was one of the pictures that he had on his wall. Um, probably a little bit risque for the time, I guess. The kitchen, and I've included this, there's Dice Murphy again, through to the workshop, Walter Hannum, the radio operator. That's the kitchen bench, stove over there, just keep that in mind there. Um, that's the kitchen bench now. So there's still a lot of snow and ice in the building. What we want to do is we do want to affect, you know, remove all of this if we can. We've started excavating the kitchen, and so we've removed, we start from the top and move down. It was lovely when we started, we found all these bottles up there. Especially, you know, you sort of chip through and you, you see a McKinlay Scotch label and you think, oh yeah. But um, Mawson didn't leave anything behind. There was though no, completely, <laughs> completely empty. I mean, we wouldn't have been, it would have been interesting to sample it and just see how the Scotch had aged over the years. Okay, just a few of the locals checking the place out. One of the last big jobs we did structurally was put a new roof on the building, on the main hut. And we had to do this because these battens were being lost. There was a batten there originally, and all evidence associated with um, the sail cloth that was used to seal the building, and also um, that was all being lost, but the building was leaking. And so we had to put a new roof on it. The problem was when we got down there, you couldn't... Um, the building is almost buried. And so the first thing we had to do was dig it out. And that, that took a long time. We ended up moving something like 80 cubic metres of snow and ice. We'd expose one roof plane at a time and overclad it. There's no point doing more than that because if you get a blizzard, it just fills up again. But we were very, very lucky to be able to get all of the work done without any major blows. This was, I've included this one because we initially discussed whether or not we should take scaffolding down with us so that, you know, for an ock health and safety thing, we wouldn't hurt ourselves when we fell off the roof. <laughs> we had to put a fence up so we wouldn't hurt ourselves when we fell onto the roof. <laughs> so it was uh, the opposite. But the, um, the actual overcladding was, was really neat, and it, it, a lot of the work I've done in the past has been related to shipwreck conservation. Ships in the 1600s, sacrificial skin of pine over the oak, they go sailing around, Torito worm chews its way through the pine, you strip it off, you put a new layer on. And so what we did with Mawson's huts was apply the same basic principle to it. We put a layer of battens like this underneath attached to the structural timbers. Then we put this snow-proof, waterproof membrane on the top, another layer of battens, and these have got little channels cut out of them so that if any um, snow and ice gets through this outer layer and then melts, it can drain out. So it won't build up in there. But in 50 or 60 years' time, and it'll be... About that, I imagine, these tongue and roof timbers are going to be shot. You can just rip them off, put a new layer on, and you're not going to be damaging the original timber. If you did want to get through to the original roof, you can do it easily enough just by peeling it off. So that's the, uh, the job when it was finished. We've also done a bit of artefact conservation. We've built a little laboratory down there. This is attached to the living quarters. It's quite a nice lab. The end of summer, we've got to just take all of our equipment, put it into a big virtually a bloody great big esky, and put silica gel in there to keep the electrical stuff dry, and then away we go. Some of the things in, that are still left behind, this is inside uh, Hurley's darkroom, so a lot of the chemicals and so on are still there. Books, pretty tatty. Mawson took all the good books, left the penny dreadfuls. Um, 
And they, were, they got sick of reading them in the second year. I think they'd read them two or three times over. This is not what I like, um, these little things. When you excavate the ice off one of the bunks and you find um, a book there, this little tin with a candle in it, and you can just imagine after the lights have been turned out and they had an acetylene generating plant, um, you could, that would be off. This was on uh, Carell's bunk. You can see him just laying there reading by candlelight. Uh, dog chain. Um, this one I like because that was in the uh, pre-conserved state. This is conserved. We don't do anything to take them back to new. What we do is we just stop them corroding more. But what was fantastic about this one was that when we got recovered it from the, uh, from the workshop, it was frozen solid. We took it back to the lab, which is at about 8 or 10 degrees, and it thawed out, and it just smelt like wet dog. And so it was, just, it's quite, it, was, it was really quite evocative to sort of think you've got this smell of dog from about 90 years ago. It's no less uh, pleasant, or sorry, it's as unpleasant as modern dog. Um, just little things, matchboxes, just repair jobs on those. And we apply the same principle to um, plates and pans and pots. We stabilise them against corrosion, but we leave grease and oil and whatever on them just as evidence of, of their previous use. Okay, very quickly I'll finish off with some happy snaps. Um, you can't go to the Antarctic, I don't think, with at least having a few um, shots of penguins and other people. I'm trying to work out who's more multicoloured here, Megan or uh, the king penguin. This is on uh, Macquarie Island, by the way. These birds will just come straight over to you. They'll peck your clothing, they'll peck you. They want to see what you're made of, basically. The royal penguin or the, the punk penguin. Quite gorgeous. There's something like... I think 850,000 of those, just of just the, the royal penguins. And then you've got the king penguins on top of that. That's the juvenile king penguin, um, the pimp without the bling, I think. And uh, just on a beach, you, you go onto the beaches at Sandy Bay and other places, and there are literally thousands of these penguins there. Um, and the interesting thing is, because they can breed all year round, they're, they're in various stages. So this one is a juvenile who's still got his full fur coat, these two are in various stages. This one's got the egg on the foot. Um, so they're going through the whole lot. A Weddell seal. Now these were a prime source of food and also blubber for Morse and his team. I think it would have been quite difficult to kill them, to be honest. I'd, I'd find it difficult because they're just like a, you know, the Antarctic cat. They're very cute looking, but you get a lot of meat out of them. You get a lot of skins. And there are still skins, stacks of skins, stacks of uh, daily penguins around Mawson's hut. Because even in that second year when they're waiting for Davis to come back and pick them up, they weren't sure that the ship had come back. So they've got to start killing penguins in case they had to spend another year there. Killing penguins, killing seals. So you get caches of penguins this high that are just stored outside in the ice. They're getting a bit skeletal now. Um, that was earlier this year. Um, the dog um, is called Stay. Um, because it's the, only, it's the only command that he, uh, he obeys. But he's, uh, he's sort of uh, a veteran of the Australian Antarctic Division. I was quite surprised because I was down there and um, the helicopter came in with a load of cargo and out popped Stay. Now, he's got his own passport um, wherever he goes and he just travels around the different Antarctic stations. And um, wherever he goes, you put a new st the postmaster will put the stamp in for, uh, for that. So at the moment... Stay is still down at Cape Denison. <laughs> what we did was we took him over and we put him inside the field hut. We thought we'd better leave him a bowl, but he doesn't really drink much or eat much, so we left it empty. But he's got his rug, stamped his passport. He's going to be there at Christmas this year, so we put some Christmas ears on him and left him there. <laughs> got to have the uh, iceberg shots. I mean, for me, I just I love them. The more misshapen the berg, the better it is. They've weathered, and there's something really quite magnificent about them. And, you know, the bergs that you can see, they, they can vary. They can be 100 kilometres long. They can be relatively small. This wasn't taken... This is a bit of a cheap... This wasn't taken at Cape Denison. It was taken at Casey Station when I went on an iceberg cruise in the evening. But I just love the sort of scalloped look of that berg. And then finally, um, just some shots of uh, these little guys leaping out of the water because this was my 10th trip to the Antarctic and I'd never been able to get a photograph of them penguins jumping out of the water. I think no one had told them that they can't fly. And uh, normally at Cape Denison, you have these little snow cliffs around the edge and they're a metre and a half to two metres high. 
And what the Adelie penguins do, they go out, they feed, and then when they're coming back to shore, they just accelerate and go up like that so that they can make it up onto the, up onto the little ice cliffs. Now this year, at this particular season, this is all sea ice by the way, so underneath here is the ocean, it was just perfectly flat. And so we go down there with our camera, just set it on automatic, when you see the penguins coming in from feeding out here, and they're heading in this direction, you just put the camera on automatic and just shoot. And so you get these <laughs> sort of shots of, uh, of the penguins going. They're, they're, good at, they're good at leaping, they're not so good at landing. That's, that's the only problem. But it's just, it's just fantastic. What I, what, I quite, what I quite like about this photograph, this one's almost saying, what the hell is that? You know, there's this strange person on the shore in front of me. And then this one, uh, this for me is sort of a, a cracker because you've almost got the cheer squad here and you know, just looking at it and thinking, yeah, what a perler of a leap. I just want to finish off um, with uh, you know the Hyde Park corner shot and just the fact because one of the one of the things that's critical with any expedition is the selection of the teams. I think Mawson was exceptional in terms of selecting a team because he's selected people who could do the science and could do the work that they wanted, but they also had to be able to get on. And there were obviously going to be some difficulties and some issues amongst people. I mean, I'm not, I know that Murphy didn't get on particularly well with Mawson. Hurley was a real joker, but you needed people like that to sort of lighten the effort. Um, in the second year, uh, a radio operator, Jeffries, was left behind. Um, and Jeffries was a person that Mawson had rejected for the post of radio operator. It was a very sad story because Jeffries suffered, um, I would assume, it's a serious case of depression, possibly a psychosis as well in that second year. And so he got the radio operating, which was wonderful, but... He was sending out messages like, you know, they're all going mad, they're turning the heat up, they're trying to kill me. He accused Mawson of putting him under a magnetic spell and then goes, I resign. And so he's got the radio operator, radio working, but he's sending out all these bizarre messages. So all I want to say is, you know, you can see the camaraderie, the success of an expedition depends entirely on these sorts of things. And then reading Harrison's diaries, and I'll read that out just in case you can't read it at the back, um, the wife left the room. This was after they'd got back from the expedition. We joined hands all round and sang Old Lang Syne and then the second party was no more. It was the worst part of the whole expedition, this breaking up. And it gives you some sort of an idea of the friendships and the bonds that are, that are formed when, you're, when you live together, you work together in these sorts of extreme environments. And I'll just finish off with this shot. This was uh, a team of people that uh, I was with earlier. I've included this just to show you that Antarctic cross-dressing is still alive. Um, that's Psycho. I didn't even know he'd bought down his Auntie Jack black and uh, blue frock. But uh, we had been out playing a game of cricket because it was Australia Day, and so you have to have a game of cricket in the snow, and out came Psycho dressed in that, that frock. But uh, again, um, as with Mawson's team, I've been very, very lucky um, to be able to be part of teams that have been hand-selected and so you normally go down, you don't have any problems because it's essential. You've got to be able to do your job, but you've got to be able to get on with people. And just in conclusion, I've, I've got a few acknowledgements there and I'd, I'd particularly like to you know, acknowledge the WA Museum because without the support of the museum, I wouldn't have been able to take part in this work. And it really has been unbelievably rewarding on a whole range of levels. But also the Morrison's Hutt Foundation, the Australian Antarctic Division, and also fellow expeditioners, including Peter Boyer, who collected a lot of these images of Hurley's um, slides that you've seen. So that's it from me. I've gone a little bit over, but I hope uh, that uh, it's been sufficiently enjoyable for you.